My name is Forbes Lowe from the Kingston Chamber of Commerce and I'm delighted to welcome you again to our Think Green um, Bite Size webinars and today we will be talking about being a net zero hero. Um, and the, the background to this, as so much of you probably already know with the news, is how we can do our bit to reduce carbon emissions and make a difference to the planet. Um, to in your business world to help your customers and your own business which can attract and retain your staff save money through your efficiencies and improve your company image and even boost your brand value um, as so many of you know this is running uh, parallel with cop 26 and one of our guests this morning dr neil jennings is actually up there at the moment um, and in uh, I'm not sure if the word enjoying the, the the time up there but certainly it's a very informative period for him. Um, so before I begin I would like to just welcome everybody to our guests. We have Paul Elgar MBE who is the Director of International Affairs at UK Fashion and Textile Association. We have Dr Neil Jennings who's the Partnerships Development Manager at the Grantham Institute Imperial College. We have Adam Lewis, who is the owner of the Lamb Pub in Surbiton. We have Stephanie Todd, Sustainability Manager at Kingston University. Um, I think we had a run through the other day and I think there's a terrific amount of information with this. And one of the whole objectives of this is to try and put this into kind of a layman's language to make this really practical for the businesses which you work in. Um, and to really give you a sense of inspiration and something tangible which you can take away with you. Um, so we, we do have a caveat, we're gonna really reduce the amount of jargon here. Uh, and as I say, just put this into a good bite-sized language. Um, this is going to be recorded so if you don't want to be seen on screen please put yourself off camera um, and we will share this webinar a little bit later it's going to be for about 55 minutes um, uh, Joanna Rossi from uh, uh, the Kingston Council has a few messages right at the very end if you do have questions please use the chat function um, the last time we did this, there was a terrific amount of engagement with yourselves in the, the chat. Some came over into the meeting, some was between yourselves. So please make use of that. Um, and we'll try and bring in the questions if, it, if it's appropriate at the right time. We do have quite a few kind of um, questions which we pulled together from a lot of you. So we'll try and make this really condensed and um, really informative. So first of all, enough from me. Can I first of all introduce um, Stephanie Todd from Kingston University? Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Sustainability Manager at Kingston University. So just a few facts about Kingston um, Uni. So we have 19,000 students that study with us, 5,000 of which are international students. So we have um, a very big influence and big responsibility in this area. Um, the reason that I'm interested in, in net zero is because it's, it's such a critical goal for humanity for us to be working towards um, tackling climate change is, uh, you know, what, one of the big, biggest goals that we, we have as a, a collective nation. Um, and it's essential that we achieve net zero, put simply, if we want to succeed um, in a, a, a business sense, in an environmental sense, in a, a social sense as well. So I'm um, very looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you, Stephanie. Can I welcome Adam, Adam Lewis? Hi, everyone. I'm Adam Lewis. I have a micro or small business uh, as a pub in Surbiton. I was first interested in uh, environmentalism many, many years ago. I read science journals a lot and... Uh, frankly, it was slowly terrifying me and I thought to be part of the part of the solution rather than the problem. So I tried to make changes in my in my business. Every time I have to replace or buy something, I try and keep environmentalism in mind. And uh, so I replace with LEDs, uh, insulate when I can and, and various things like that. And I think it's more of a mindset for an SME than um, going to a consultant, which is a very expensive process. If that can be changed in the future, that would be great. But at the moment, I'm just doing what I can 
um, everywhere that I can. That's where I am. And uh, the word mindset will come back quite a few times in this conversation. I think you'll hear it. It's one of the most important parts to this. Um, can I introduce you to Paul Algar? Good morning, everyone. I'm Paul Alga from the UK Fashion and Textile Association. Um, fashion textile industry takes its carbon footprint and its ethical trade very seriously. We are one of the uh, more polluting industries out there, not the most polluting industry. So there's a lot of talk within the fashion and textile industry about how we reach net zero. Indeed, what is net zero? But looking also at the ethical trade uh, side of things, which I'm sure we'll talk on later on. Thank you, Paul. Yes. And finally, but not last but not least, Neil. Neil Jennings. Morning, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Neil from the Grantham Institute, which is a centre for climate change and environment research at Imperial College. And I'm a Kingston resident now and born and bred in Kingston, lived here most of my life. Um, so my role at Imperial is, is Partnership Development Manager. So broadly speaking, I help to support the communication of research outside the university to um, the business community and also to the policy community. Um, so we have partnerships, for example, with Sainsbury's um, and also a new one with the band Coldplay, um, helping them to uh, reduce the emissions or understand the emissions of their, of their tours and, and take actions to reduce them. So just by way briefly of background, I did a PhD in climate change about 15 years ago. And a year into my PhD, I was quite overwhelmed by the weight of evidence and just the fact that that evidence was not being backed up by meaningful action on the ground. So I set up a, a small campaign called the Student Switch Off um, to try and engage university students in pro-environmental behaviour change and gradually grew that and set that up as a, an SME um, and, and ran that for 10 years until I joined Grantham um, about three years ago. And I'm really delighted to be here. And so my motivation is clearly... Um, trying to get more action on, on climate change, particularly for you know, future generations and the, and the future that they will inherit. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, so we're going to start with, um, actually, with Neil, continue with Neil, and actually ask probably a simple question itself. But can you actually explain in layman's language, what do you think net zero really means? Yeah. So I suppose yeah, we all have quite a good level of awareness now that um, from the science that it's, as kind of Adam also alluded to as well, in terms of the evidence base that greenhouse gases caused by burning of fossil fuels are warming our, our earth. And the science tells us that to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, we need to roughly halve our emissions by 2030 and get to what's called net zero by 2050. And that, that term can be a bit abstract. So I'll try and explain briefly um, what that means so that's that's kind of talking about balancing out the emissions that go into the atmosphere of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide um, and balancing that out against the way in which those those emissions are being uh, drawn down or absorbed um, elsewhere in the environment so um, from the burning of fossil fuels in one place um, you can have that carbon dioxide being absorbed by for example by by tr by trees um, elsewhere and to get to a state of net zero the amount going into the atmosphere will be balanced out by the amount that's being absorbed um, and so that's what we talk about when we're getting to, to net zero it's effectively a, a balance between what's going in and, and what's coming out um, and so in terms of in, in practical terms that means looking at ways in which we can reduce the amount going into the atmosphere um, to and that it can involve things like shifting towards renewable energy better insulating our homes um, and moving away from petrol and diesel vehicles. Get myself off mute, <laughs> should know better by now. Um, thank you, Neil. I think, again, one of the things which I'm really fascinated and delighted about with today is, is that we've got such a broad area from the, the university with the younger generation coming through from Adam working in his the pub to Paul's and the fashion industry. So I think there's gonna be quite a lot of really interesting different standpoints with this. Um, and I'd like to kind of go forward with that and say to Adam is kind of exactly what does net zero mean for your business? I know that you have a, it's not an issue with, but just the actual phrase net zero and that whole thing the definition of that so can you just give us show your perspective how it actually means for you and your daily work yes thanks Paul. um for me i find net zero a little misleading in the sense that um 
really we, we need to strive to achieve neg uh, net negative or sorry carbon negative for the reason that uh, unless you constantly manage it um, and are constantly watching it, you're going to dip into net positive. You're going to dip into carbon positive without knowing about it and it doesn't help anyone so create a buffer try and overachieve try and get to a, an even better position and then you're covered in in case you have a bonfire or or uh, burn something or have to buy something that's new or dispose of something that's big um so i, I always think you really have to overachieve on this just to 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 be sure that you've achieved net zero uh, personally um yeah. Can you just explain a wee bit more in terms of um, sort of when you sort of looking at it, you've looked you've explained in the past a little bit from sort of light bulbs to furniture and just how actually you look at all these different things and it's really your mindset and your approach with this, how you look at each kind of investment or every every kind of change. Can you just go through that a wee bit? Yeah, so um uh, for example, recently um, a light bulb had gone out in the gents' toilet, and um, these light bulbs cost five pounds each, and they have a small filament in them. Um, they are fairly good, at energy efficient. But I went out and bought a new. Well, I went and looked on the internet. I researched different types of LED bulb. I found LED fittings now, which are more even more efficient than the bulbs, much better light. Um, so I needed less of them in the space um they cost me about 20 pounds and so four light bulbs it's it's paid for itself and and i fixed it actually finding the information out there and the finger pointing you in the right direction is 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 pretty much non-existent unless you want to pay for that so doing the research looking at the specs on various pieces of kit and every time you have to replace something do that and if you can repair it then do as well I've got a small wood workshop. I'm fairly handy with my hands. So I repair chairs all the time, um, repair rungs on things, and I, I repair where possible. Um, and if I have to replace it, I do the research on what I'm replacing it with and try and dispose of what I'm disposing of responsibly. That's another part of this that you have to look at. It's very easy just to pass the problem on to somebody else and, and not think about where your items have come from. Uh, toilet paper being another example. Uh, lots of people have um, cut the crap or what I can't remember what it's called. There's a, a famous brand. Oh, who gets the crap? Yeah, but it comes from China. It comes from China. So I found one that comes in from the UK. It's recycled paper and it comes in biodegradable plastic. I then looked up what biodegradable was. The plastic packaging is biodegradable in a compost heap and not just in one of these special facilities in Sweden, I think it is. Um, so just doing a little bit of research and delving a little bit deeper is, is, is the way we can make a real difference rather than going for the easy option and just replacing like for like. I think the other thing you mentioned about furniture as well. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, re I repair all of my furniture. Um, unfortunately, it's been an upward battle with that and I didn't repair very well at the beginning and I had things falling apart and people, which wasn't brilliant. But... I've got very good at it now. I found the right glues to use and um, I repair and I even build furniture. I've just built a complete stage system out in my garden um, and a canopy, which building myself has saved me a fortune. Um, and most of what I've done, uh, I've used a recycled wood from a loft conversion that I've done. And I've also gone and skip dived for wood because it's very expensive at the moment. Just wherever you can always think in a it's, a it's about the mindset it's about thinking every decision you make has to be on the right side not the wrong side i think and again that that issue of the mindset will keep coming through in these conversations i believe um and also from what adam mentioned in terms of um how you can do your homework we're going to look at that a wee bit later because uh it's not that straightforward um but i think what's interesting for most of us is that adam i cannot do diy to save my life but i do think it's very interesting how you can if you just think to looking at second-hand products necessary rather than necessarily going to brand new can can make a big big difference which yeah, all, all of my furniture is second-hand yeah 
interesting, which leads quite nicely into Paul and the world of fashion, because there's a lot of pushes and pulls in the fashion industry when it certainly becomes to recycling. And you did mention at the beginning that you're probably, the fashion industry is uh, quite possibly one of the second biggest kind of polluters, which was quite striking. We are, and, and, and I think it's, um... I'm picking up on something that Adam, Adam said about carbon neutrality and, and, and carbon negative. I think as human beings, all of us have to remember that from the moment we wake up and, and even as soon as when we've brushed our teeth, we are beginning to have an impact on the environment. The very toothpaste that we uh, use will have been made somewhere in a way using fuels and then shipped from somewhere. So all of this has an impact. And I think the mindset is very, very important here. Um, I know that the Chancellor at COP26 yesterday was talking about how the city is going to solve all our problems by uh, making all of these banks uh, investment carbon, uh, carbon net zero. The challenge is often when you are buying things. So for businesses, for example, who are offering a service or retailers who might look at their carbon footprint in the, in the narrowest form, um, that's relatively straightforward, even though, as Adam has already pointed out, it's not the easiest thing to do, but a mindset will get you a certain way. When you start to manufacture goods, then you are using raw materials from the earth, you are using the earth's precious resources, and so, uh, and you're also using energy to produce those, and then once the goods are made, you're using energy often fossil fuel to ship those goods from wherever they've been manufactured to wherever the customer is. So I suppose that the line I would tend to adopt is we're all in this together, um, whether we're in the industry or outside the industry. And the fashion textile industry is very aware of its carbon footprint because we manufacture. But I think there is often a misconception that if you're not manufacturing products that you don't have a carbon footprint because you very definitely do and my carbon footprint is important to me if I'm buying goods that are made in the UK close to home then that's generally good if I'm buying goods from China halfway around the world then my carbon footprint is likely to be a lot heavier because the goods are going to come from a long way away. Um, and there's also a pretty good chance that those goods are going to be produced using fossil fuel because China is one, not the only big users of fossil fuel. And I saw an, ad, an article only this morning that while well, COP26 is going on, fossil fuel usage in manufacturing is going through the roof. We're already at 2019 levels and heading out to a very dangerous place. Thank you, Paul. Um, there's a lot of good information there, and I'm sure we'll be dipping back into that a little bit. Um, to, to Stephanie, uh, is net zero actually a practical achievement? Yes, I think it, it, has, it has to be a practical achievement. I mean, setting a net zero target, that's the starting point. So the university, we have set our net zero target to um, the year of 2038, 2039. And we've aligned ourselves to RBK's net zero target. And that target has formed part of our five year sustainability plan that we've been working on during the COVID period. It's provided an opportunity to us for us to really assess our sustainability impact, not just from an estate's perspective, but actually through our teaching, learning and research and, and you know, what we are sharing with our students who are gonna be the future leaders of the world. But I mean, going back to your question around, is it a practical achievement? So setting the target, that's the starting point. And that is really the, uh, the impetus and what will drive you to make those practical changes that I think are the really exciting part of this conversation. Um, it's it's those changes you make as a business that are really going to create that that wider change in the world and all of those small changes add up you know whether you're a small business collectively as a borough we have it you know a, a considerable impact so 
at the university, we've put some practical measures in place um, that, that follow something called the energy hierarchy, which is something that is, is a really valuable tool for everyone to take away from today. Um, Put simply, the energy hierarchy starts off with the most preferable option, which is switching off your lights, energy saving, which is something that we do at the university. And the least preferable option is offsetting, you know, what you can't reduce in the first place. So we've put, look, we've, we've, we've put lots of different measures in place from a practical perspective to get us on the road to net zero. That's everything from reducing our gas use to improving building insulation, um, also looking at procurement of renewable energy as well. So 30% of our electricity at the university is sourced 100% from renewable energy from UK wind farms, and we're looking to increase that. Um, but then also investing in renewables on our estate as well. So um, our new townhouse building, which is a Sterling award-winning building, which some of you may have seen, which we're very proud of. Uh, we have 300 meters squared of solar panels on the roof of the townhouse, which is supplying 15% of the building's electricity. So there are lots of practical measures you can put in place. And obviously they are going to differ depending upon the nature, the size and the scale of your business. So it is a practical achievement and it has to be because the other option of not putting these practical changes in place, quite frankly, is very scary if we just continue with business as usual. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, going a wee bit further forward then, because uh, we have had a really, obviously, an extremely difficult 18 months. Um, like nothing that any of us could have anticipated. And it's been a sub substantial drain on a lot of our emotional efforts as well as our financial um, efforts. So, I mean, dealing with COVID. So is, is actually net zero a big financial ask at this point? I mean, we've just got over a massive hurdle. Um, there is a kind of expectation, oh God, this is, this is gonna be a big drain on, on ourselves and our businesses. Um, is that for real or, or is, there, is there a bit of mythology with, with that? I'll start with Neil and then go to Adam. Sure, yeah, I mean, it's clearly been a very challenging 18 months for everyone. I think um, one, the one thing I would say is that the public opinion polling at the moment suggests that con concern with climate change is as high as it's ever been. So in terms of the, the need from, uh, I don't like using the word consumers because I think that, that reduces us down to people who just buy things. So we'll say citizens instead, but, but at the point at which we're buying things, there's more demand than ever for um, sustainable products and services. Um, and so the kind of level of, um, yeah, level of demand from the public suggests that when, we, when we're building back, if you're using, using that kind of phrase from um, the, the, the crisis that there's opportunities for businesses to be doing so in a way which aligns themselves with action on climate change because that's a good thing to do from a business perspective to be providing goods and services that people are actually wanting um, as well as you know us as individuals working for, for, for companies wanting to change our businesses and organizations from the inside as well the level of demand that there is from um, us as employees I think is as high as it has been on the on the financial side of stuff I, I did pull up some of the kind of stats which I think it's worth saying at the kind of at the national level so the Committee on Climate Change estimate that to get to net zero as a country, we'll need to spend around 1.4 trillion pounds by 2050, which is clearly a huge amount of money. But when you think about that in percentage terms, that equates to 2% of GDP. So a question we can ask ourselves is, do we think as a society, we should spend 2% of our GDP to create a world which is sustainable? <laughs> and I think it's a, uh, that I think should come across as something of a no brainer. Um, and that doesn't take in, that's a gross cost, that doesn't take into account the benefits that this transition brings to society uh, as, as well. So many of the things which have been spoken about already in terms of shifting towards LEDs, improving insulation, are things which provide a savings, a bottom line savings, because they are a more efficient way to do things. When we look at vehicles, for example, uh, electric vehicles now are already cheaper to run over their lifetime cost than diesel and petrol vehicles because the cost of electricity is so much cheaper um, and we've seen obviously in the last couple of months with the hikes in prices at the petrol stations and the lack of availability of, of petrol for example just how much of an issue that is and how it makes rational sense to shift ourselves away from fossil fuels for a whole variety of reasons also related to things like um, kind of energy security um, so but that doesn't get away from the fact that, that in many cases there are upfront costs 
Um, and so for electric vehicles, for example, the upfront cost of electric vehicle was still pricey at the moment. They're still more expensive, albeit within the next five years, they're likely to be on, on cost kind of, kind of parity terms with petrol and diesel vehicles. And that's where I think there is more needed for SMEs, businesses, in terms of support for some of those upfront costs. Um, so it's good to see announcements around electric heat pumps, for example. Um, so that's coming in from next year at the domestic level for um, £5,000 grants for, for heat pumps, but will likely lead, need much more than has already been announced because that equates to only about 33,000 homes uh, a year. Um, albeit that, that fits in with the wider picture of helping the initial uptake, the initial upscaling, which then reduce costs for everyone else. So uh, in answer to your question, I've rambled a bit. Um, it is a challenge and there are significant upfront costs. They can often pay for themselves in the long term, but there is more support required at the national level, but also from at the local level from, from councils as well to support SMEs to make those initial steps. Thank you very much, Neil. I think um, as a contrast, I'd like to go to Adam. There is a question in the chat from David Randall, which I will ask Adam just after he's done his bit, because again, he's he's dipped into this area. So it'd be interesting to see what his response is. But just generally to answer that question in terms of affordability, um, the pros and the cons of this, can you shed some light on sort of what it means to you? And then also, as I say, um, David Randall's cost a question which I'll come to you. It's about affordable way of getting extra insulation. Yes, uh, I really think that the the question of affordability and the question of cost, if you if you don't have the money, you don't have the money and maybe don't replace it right now. But I'm I'm done with buying rubbish that damages the planet. I'm, I'm I, I, I sometimes I have to. I found out recently by an electricity company is greenwashed and um, I'm looking to change. But I have to have electricity and so I'll make the decision in the right direction next time and make sure that I do better. Um, the, the question of affordability and cost, COVID did cost us a lot of money and, and uh, actually took the money that I was putting aside to try and put solar panels on the roof, which I've actually not been able to do because the Conservation Committee won't let me take down my chimneys, which cast a shadow on my roof, which makes the solar panels inefficient. And there are swings and roundabouts, but as far as cost is concerned, it is going to be an expensive transition. It is going to be difficult. It is going to be a problem. And the sooner we start changing things, the sooner we start replacing things that need replacing with environmentally friendly options, um, the better. And it's not it's not a question of um, I just I just simply won't buy things that are going to damage the environment anymore. I, I'm, I'm done with that. I've done my mourning process for what we've already done to our children's future. And I, I, I'm done with that. I'm, 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 every decision I make is green. Um, and it's as simple as that, really. Uh, if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. Thank you. Uh, very good bit of practical advice there. Uh, to, to, I don't know if we can uh, answer um, the specific question here, but in terms right, of David your experience of um, when you were looking at the extra insulation and solar panels, obviously you couldn't do it, but when you were doing that research, did you see areas where there were grants? No, um, I found it very, very hard to find any, any financial support at all for the insulation, and I've in fact gone out and bought it myself. Um, we did Back in 2009, I think, we got a free roll of that fluffy stuff for the roof, um, the rock wall, um, but that was it. Oh, and some pipe insulation, but I mean, this is an enormous building to, uh, one roll of rock wall and, and three pipe lags just doesn't really do anything at all and was fairly pointless. There was no other funding. I haven't looked recently and I have seen in the chat that there is a, a link that I'm gonna have a look at that says there is something that helps SMEs, but no, I, I found it like pulling hen's teeth. Um, it's just nothing there. So it's again, it's just what I do and it's every every decision I make. I was, I was yeah. gonna say Forbes, if I can, yeah. one, one, of, one of the issues that we face in, in the question around sustainability, being kind to planet and my definition of ethical trade, which is being kind to people, which is the other side of this definition, is that we as a country 
um, put a lot of faith in the market to find the right solutions. But I think it's fairly clear that the market has not encouraged the right decisions and that the market very often drives exactly the wrong decisions. So from a fashion and textile point of view, that drives consumers to want more goods more cheaply and for us as the industry to pursue this dangerous and terrifying quest for the cheapest needle, which is the term that we use in the industry. But similarly, it means that when a business or a family, um, particularly a low income family, has got to replace light bulbs, they're more likely to replace them with cheap light bulbs that use more energy rather than more expensive light bulbs that will use less. So I think we have to be, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should be militant uh, and start gluing ourselves to the M25. I'll, I'll leave that to other people and I admire their courage and determination, but we do need to be much more questioning. Consumers, and we are all consumers, need to be really questioning where things come from, how they are made. And then we also need to question the choices we make in our own life. So, for example, if you go into a store and try to buy two T-shirts for five pounds, the chances are they haven't been made in an ethical way. The chances are the person that made them wasn't paid an awful lot of money. Um, and the chances are that they were shipped a long way around the world using a lot of fossil fuel. So there's a huge amount of responsibility, I think, that, that falls on all of our shoulders. And just relying on the market to solve the problems is, is not working for us. Uh, that's incredibly interesting because it really kind of leads on to the next kind of question, which is the issue of kind of ethics and sustainability. Because, as you said, in your industry, there's that fast fashion, the culture of that. And it is quite economically driven to a certain extent. <laughs> and um, there is that pressure on, as you say, individuals. It's easy, it's cheaper to spend five pounds on two t shirts than it is to invest in a t-shirt which is 20 pounds but maybe last you a whole lot longer and just understanding those balances um stephanie we, we talked about this a wee bit before what, what's your view on this yeah i mean it's also interconnected <clears throat> isn't it when we think about net zero and ethics and you know even when we talk about sustainability i think individuals can quite easily grasp onto that environmental sustainability side of things but actually sustainability incorporates environment you know ethics and economy and it thinks something is only truly sustainable when we're thinking about all of those three three aspects in harmony together um, and, and bringing it back to that you know that human side when we think about net zero and climate change it's it's easy to get very focused on the environmental impacts that we're having and you know the, the damage to the planet and um, obviously that's incredibly important but but this is also a, you know, a human a human rights problem we've got going on here as well. Um, that the impacts of climate change are not equal across, across the world and, and they're not felt equally at all. Actually, that the largest and, and the gravest environmental impacts are, are faced by the poorest, the people that aren't, or don't have that resilience, don't have that uh, extra buffer in their bank account to be able to respond to these uh, significant environmental and climate related disasters that we're seeing. I mean, last July, uh, a quarter of Bangladesh was flooded due to instabilities in our climate climate system. So, you know, we're seeing the world getting uh, more unstable in terms of our, our, our weather and uh, climate systems with uh, increased heating resulting in increased evaporation into our atmosphere, areas becoming more and more arid. And, and these are the locations where you know, as consumers or going back to what Neil was saying as citizens, we're drawing and expecting all of these resources and all of these products to come from. So, I mean, I often think about how, you know, the, the planet is going to be fine long, long after we're gone. You know, this it, it comes back to that human issue that we've got here. Do we want to do we really want to create a future that is, you know, difficult for the children of today? It's not a case of saying, oh, this is you know, happening in, in years to come, my, my grandchildren's children's children's, this, this is happening now. So it's, it's crucial that we 
we act, we have a very small window of opportunity to do this. And it really is within everyone's gift to do something. Just like Adam was saying, there's no perfect way for each individual to, to do this. It is really a case of, of getting started. You know your business better than anyone else does. So yes, you can employ a consultant and it may cost some money, but actually with that enthusiasm and going back to that mindset, when you have that mindset like Adam, I mean, how inspiring to hear you know, the, the, the work that you're doing in your pub, that is what drives practical change. Going back to your question, Forbes, about practical achievement. Is it practical? Well, if you've got the mindset and obviously, yes, you need the, the resources and the time and the capacity. But yes, we, we, we can do this. Sorry, right, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. No, no, no. I'm actually, I mean, we're, uh, it, it leads me a little bit. It's a slight segue, but you have 19, the university has so many students, 19,000, 19, did 19, you say? 19,000, yeah. And I mean, that generation coming up, there's a lot which I'm sure they're grasping this and becoming their own leaders in this, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I alluded to earlier on, I mean, our, our five-year sustainability plan, whilst, whilst we have a big focus on net zero and, and creating a regenerative estate, so not just about cutting carbon emissions, but also uh, supporting biodiversity net gain and, and uh, the natural habitats we have on our campus sites. Actually, it's about embedding sustainability within our curriculum so that it's not just the environmental science students and the geography students that are coming out understanding how sustainability relates to them. Actually, it's our pharmacy students that understand how the work they are doing is contributing towards good health and well-being, which is one of the UN sustainable development goals. And again, how can you have good health and well-being when you're facing climate risk and disaster in your own backyard? So it, it is also connected. And I think sometimes that can be the difficult thing to communicate to people. How can you communicate that in a tweet or a, uh, an Instagram post? You can't. It, it comes from discussions like this. I think if I can just add to that as well, I think I, can, I entirely agree with what, uh, what Stephanie just said. And I think, so we're, you know, we're seeing these kind of changes, the demand from young people in the courses that they study. So it's, it's very much coming from young people. And you yeah. think about you know, students when they leave universities, the demand for them to go and work for a company who is practicing what, 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 they're, what they're preaching and actually to be delivering on this, some of this stuff. So I think from the business side of stuff, there, the opportunities there are to be attracting the best quality new employees, by, by, by showing that you are an employer who is taking action uh, seriously on this issue because that is, there's so much more demand than I've ever seen before from young people to be going and working for companies who are really pushing forward on this agenda. One, one of the things that I see, uh, certainly when I go to London Fashion Week, for example, is a whole generation of university educated designers who are passionate proponents of, and, uh, of protecting the environment, sustainable and fair trade. The problem tends to be that the goods that they produce when they have gone through that process are more expensive than they might be if they were made cheaply in China. So I see designers on the one hand who are putting their businesses at risk, putting out good products that don't affect the designer. I'm thinking about people like Christopher Rayburn, Phoebe English, Bethany Williams, for example. But the average British person on a low income family cannot afford those products. And you know, again, the dysfunctionality of our market, and I referred to the market before, it means that the vast majority of people in the UK can't afford or don't choose to buy the goods that we manufacture in the UK. Um, and if you wanted as an exercise of a weekend to give yourself something to amuse you and anger you at the same time is try and find an electric drill or a toaster that is not made in China, I promise you that you will not find one. Um, and, and this is an issue that we have to, that we have to address. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for interjecting that because I was going to come and ask you for, from your perspective from the fashion side of that. That's really interesting. Um, unbelievable. Well, time is flying by very quickly. But, and one of the things which I want to go back to is something which Adam said near the beginning, which was about actually getting information and clarity on what steps you can take. And I think this is incredibly important. Um, and as Adam said, it, it's not that straightforward. So I'm going to open this to the group. Um, so chip in with your offers to begin with. Um, so that really the question is finding the information on all of this 
as we've discovered, is actually really not that straightforward. Um, we've come across this new word, greenwashing and credibility. Um, first of all, Neil, would you just quickly mind saying what greenwashing is and then just your recommendations of where people here attending, where they can actually practically go to somewhere which is actually has got a bit of trust and credibility. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, green greenwashing refers to, uh, I suppose, the um, inconsistencies in what companies may be saying and, and doing. Uh, essentially, it's where that that term comes from. Um, in terms of go to sources for for businesses um, looking to decarbonize their activities, Carbon Trust is a really good um, resource to go to first. Um, at the more kind of domestic level, the Energy Saving Trust. Is, is a really good source. Um, and then there's others like Ethical Consumer, for example, um, or but some of these are, so Carbon Trust, Energy Saving Trust, most of their resources is free to access. Um, uh, ethical Consumer, which is obviously more at the kind of product level, um, some of their resources do require um, online, you know, a subscription to get access to, but you can still get a good indication of the, of what the criteria you should look for at the point at which you're buying within a particular category. So there's a, a few ones I've mentioned, I'm sure others will chip in with more. Thank you, Neil. Actually, while the others are chipping in, hopefully, uh, if you get a moment, could you put, say, the Carbon Trust um, link in the, the chat? Paul, um, I know there's, uh, there's one area which you would recommend. Um, when I'm looking at uh, certainly retailers and brands and I'm trying to work out about both their carbon footprint and also their ethical policies, I tend to use the fashion revolution as my first port of call. Um, so the fashion revolution who created the hashtag who made my clothes and who hashtag who made my fabric um, looks very much at the ethical side of industry. And they put together, I think it was two years ago, a very good um, review of all of the major international brands and retailers and looked at their carbon footprints and their human rights and ethical uh, trading um their, their their actual achievements and their rating if you like so they they rank them in a sort of a trust pilot sort of way if you like um, but i would also say always read the label we don't as consumers read the label enough we don't question enough so go into your retailer and ask where is this made who made it if they don't know they should find out they should know and if you are passionate about buying things from places closer to home, ask retailers for them, because it's only when retailers are asked for things that they make inquiries and make the change. Thank you, Paul. Um, Paul, well, sorry. To Stephanie, yeah, to Stephanie and to Adam. Paul, would you mind putting in uh, the link into the chat if, if you're able to do that? Thank you. S Stephanie and then Adam. Yeah, sure. I was just going to, to suggest the WWF um, footprint, climate footprint uh, calculator. I'll put a link on the chat after I've spoken, but that's a really good way to measure your personal footprint on the planet. Um, and the output is actually telling you based upon, you know, what you put into the, the survey, actually how many planets uh, are you reliant on? I think the last time I did it, mine was uh, one point four five or 1.2 or something in between so you know I, I'm certainly not perfect and I'm trying to make changes in in my own life as well so um that's that's quite a good way to get engaged at, at a personal level and actually that could translate to change you know within your employees as well maybe you wanted to share that with them and that could translate to you know people deciding to cycle into work as opposed to driving so I put a link in the chat it's quite an easy um, and fun tool to use and you may be quite surprised with how many planets you're using in a year. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Adam, I, I know you, you've done lots of work with Auntie Google. Um, mm. Is there anything else beyond that? Well, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I recently did some insulation um, in the eaves. I've, in fact, this here is where I cut a hole in the wall to go in and uh, sort out the eaves in here. Um, I can't remember the name of the unit now, but I've, I've started learning about this unit about how much heat transmits through a piece of insulation and then found that there are spec sheets on every single type of insulation. They all use this same unit. And I very quickly found out which one was the most efficient. I didn't have to worry about plastic because it's going to be there forever, I hope. 
Um, so it's doing its job. It's 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 in there and it seems to be very good. My house is much warmer than it was. and It's noticeably different. But just spending a little bit of time researching which one is the best, which one is the most efficient, which one has the lowest uh, mileage on it, which one has been built ethic ethically. Um, just it doesn't take that much further to, to go through the spec sheets on, on various items and find out what the commonality is and compare things. And, and before you know it, you, you found something that is a much better product than all the others that are on the market and something that will last as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as I say, time is zipping by, but there, there is the, a question from Andrew Parsons Weber earlier, which I think is really relevant to, to try and get in here. Um, because it's this whole issue of kind of being local, trying to make a difference in the local area, when the larger global approach may not be kind of catching up in the same way that we can do this. Um, and there has been an example raised about the absence of China and Russia and usages of private planes um, uh, recently. And so to, how would you, just on that local versus kind of broader international thing how would you convince somebody to say actually forget about that keep it local can i start with neil first yes i think it's a really good question so my response to this is well there's the moral side of stuff in terms of um you know the historical emissions that the uk has and the fact that we should be showing leadership and actually um being being quite you know optimistic about this side of stuff this is an opportunity as you know with kind of getting first mover status to be creating jobs across the country to be then developing industries and products which we you know sell to the to the rest of the world that are that are good for the environment and so on um, but the other side of stuff that i focus on quite a lot is around the kind of co co benefits of climate action so this isn't just about tackling climate change we've got many other challenges that we're facing as a society um one of which for example would be air pollution so you know in in the uk something like 40,000 people die a year prematurely of due to poor air quality. And, and if you think about 40,000 in terms of what we've had for COVID, you know, it's, it's a significant number of people. Um, and then in urban areas, about 60, 70% of those, that air pollution comes from vehicles. So stuff that we can do, which is good for climate change in terms of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases by moving uh, towards helping people to walk or cycle more. We've heard about things like e-cargo bikes before. Um, uh, and also stuff that can be can be done in terms of moving towards electric vehicles. That's good for climate change, but it's also really good for making sure that our kids can breathe clean air. And that uh, and so there's been lots more evidence over the last few years about the, just what a bad impact air pollution has on people are, on our health. <laughs> so it gives kids asthma. It increases the chance of elderly people getting dementia. Every one of us is affected by by air quality. So so when we talk about what like, oh what about China? I say well actually some of the stuff that we should do for tackling climate change is stuff that will is good for us to do and important for us to do morally but it's also really good for us to do in terms of uh, in, improving our quality of life you know this is this is there's vested interest in this as well as well as the moral side of stuff very well said stephanie you're nodding a lot too yeah, well. yeah i'm very passionate about air quality so I, yeah i i think that's really important and just to add to that as well i mean the, the locations where air quality is at, at its poorest is often people living in those areas are, you know, poor individuals as well. So coming back to that social inequality piece, you know, we have a, have a duty to improve the air quality for those individuals as we do for everyone. Um, but yeah, going back to your question, Forbes, around, you know, why should we do this, this locally? It can be incredibly overwhelming, you know, when we think about the impacts globally of climate change. And actually, I've I've stopped watching David Attenborough documentaries because it just, um, it's too much for me at this stage. I know what the future is and it, it doesn't look rosy if we continue as we are, but, but the gift in um, you know, looking at this from a local perspective is that it's within our control and influence. And for me, that's something that, that helps me sleep at night is that this is something that we can actually do ourselves and collectively that does add up to something considerable. So, um, you know, why should we do this at a local perspective? Because, because we can and we should. Brilliant. Um, we've got five minutes or so to go. So what I'd like to do is to just get three top tips from all of you. 
um, in terms of uh, some really good feedback on the chat about what you've all been saying, but just three top tips um, about how everybody here can sort of go out of today and sort of something which they can take away. Can I start with Paul? Paul, what would you say is a rallying call for people to go out with here? A couple of things for me, I would say, um, buy better and buy less make do and mend to a certain degree so i'm not suggesting we all darn our socks but good you know fast fashion i think we all now know is bad for your health so um, make things last longer um, and ask questions we need to be much more inquisitive about not taking things at face value so while neil was talking about electric vehicles and i absolutely agree about electric vehicles we also have to remember where the electricity to drive those electric vehicles is coming from. So if they're not, if it's not coming from sustainable sources, then that is still a problem. There are lots of people out there wanting to hide our carbon footprint from us. And again, from a fashion industry perspective, just because it's not made in the UK, it might be made in China or India, doesn't mean that the carbon footprint is any less. So have a think about your global carbon footprint rather than just the ones that, um, the, the one that applies within the borders of the UK. And the industry has been reshoring and nearshoring for the last 15 years. But Brexit makes that much more complicated, I would say. But there was no doubt in my mind that manufacturing closer to home is better for our health, it's better for our communities, and it's better for jobs. And just when you thought you could get through a webinar without Brexit being mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No. <laughs> uh, Adam, your rallying call. Yeah, just keep with the mindset. Um, every decision you make, make it in the right direction and not the wrong direction. Um, try and buy local, as Paul says. Um, support shops that are trying to make a difference um the, we've got a refill shop that's just opened up the road it's inconvenient i go i drive to the supermarket but i walk to the suit refill shop because it's the right thing to do and it no one said this was going to be easy no one said it was going to be cheap it's not but the cost to the future is is unaccountable so just get on with it brilliant thank you very much uh stephanie Yes, yeah, so I was going to suggest in terms of something to take away, you know, going back to your practical question, uh, everyone please go away and have a look at the energy hierarchy. That's something that is a really useful tool. Um, also the waste hierarchy as well. I know it doesn't sound very exciting, but those principles are something that I think about every single day in my role. Um, it can be quite overwhelming to think, where do I begin? And to have that, that hierarchy as, as a guiding principles as to, what is the best option to do that that's that's good uh, that's good to keep in your mind um i'd also suggest you know go is go for the low hanging fruit if there's something that you can easily change um that's quick to do go for it it may not be the, the you know the biggest uh change in your business that you're making but if you can do it you know don't don't wait um and finally it, it would be that uh, i think i said this earlier there is no perfect route to achieve net zero. Um, obviously, I mentioned those, the en energy hierarchy, which is useful, but the number of webinars that, that I have attended on net zero, hoping for you know, a clear answer as to how we should do this for the university, uh, even every university is different. So you know, taking that back to a business perspective, you know your business best, I've, I've already said that. Um, so you know, it is in your gift to do this obviously there are resources that you will need to do that but um you know one of the other tips from from paul i think was to to ask questions you know speak speak to other businesses and, and that should help you on your journey so more than three there but um it's hard to narrow it down to three no, no worries thank you stephanie neil yes yeah, so i think one of my former colleagues used a phrase that um 
we can't it, it, like on a personal level we can't do everything but we can all do something so linking with the other the other comments it's about getting on and doing things but for me the first step in doing that is to understand where you currently are so doing some kind of you know a, an exercise a, a baselining or measurement exercise to, to understand where your emissions come from to then be able to then work out where you should where it's best to target your time and resources where the biggest wins are going to be and obviously stephanie's already mentioned the kind of low-hanging fruit idea as well where you can do stuff quite quite a short quick change that will deliver you savings on your bottom line as well as also reducing emissions um so we have, we've mentioned also the you know you knowing your business best the other thing i'd also say within that is that your staff also will know your business pretty well so engaging with them giving them the opportunity to to come forward with ideas of things that could be done because they'll know particular parts of the business maybe better than, better than better than you do in the kind of nuts and bolts of how things are working in a particular physical location for for example so get their suggestions and 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 give people permission to make changes like so many times in people's lives they can see stuff that's that's going wrong and it frustrates them but they don't feel as if they have permission to do something about it so having those really open conversations with your em employees and, and letting them know that, that, that they have the opportunity to feed that into you and and even to you know get about making some of these changes themselves the phrase which is kind of stephanie alluded to but didn't say so i will say it is, is the phrase don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good which uh, Lord Devon, who's the, the chair of the Committee on Climate Change, always uses that uh, this stuff is difficult in some, in, in, in some cases um, and we won't get it right all the time, but we do just need to crack on and actually do stuff. So, and there might be some bumps along, along the road. Um, and so in the, in, the, in the chat, I posted our, our nine things you can do about climate change, which is something we put together aimed at the general public about, about kind of personal action. And the, the ninth one of them links in really nicely with what's been said already of, of having those conversations, like we're all gonna make mistakes, but having those conversations with other people who are on this journey as well is the key thing we can do to help to avoid the same mistakes, to uh, kind of overcome those initial, initial barriers and also to kind of normalize some of these changes as well, that it's something that we're all in and doing together. And by people feeling that, they're much more likely to want and, and demand to take more actions themselves and to encourage others to do so. Brilliant, Neil. Um, fantastic, really, really good stuff there. Really, really good information and enthusiasm. Um, before we wrap up, um, I'd like to introduce Joanna Rossi from Kingston Council, who's doing a tremendous amount of work pulling these sessions together. Um, uh, Joanna, you wanted to just say a few words here, didn't you? And you're on mute. It's not just me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, first of all, the panelists and for all this information they provided today. today. And thank you, Forbes, for uh, um, the excellent uh, um, facilitation and helping the uh, panelists to share the knowledge with us. Thank you very, very much as well, the audience, because we won't have, be able to have this event without you. I would like to um, thing to um, which I like to uh, inform you. First of all, we currently have um, an open consultation of the cl uh, cl uh, Kingston Climate Emergency Action Plan. I will post it here. Uh, do you have the link? Don't have you received it? Here is the link. Uh, so we like uh, we encourage everyone as a re as business, as a resident, or as a visitor to Kingston Council to Kingston to Barra. Uh, to complete uh, this uh, um, consultation, to share with us uh, your views and uh, we want suggestions as well. One of the sections, one of the thematic areas within the Climate Emergency Action Plan is about uh, uh, businesses, is about uh, um, green uh, economy. It's the green economy theme of the Climate Emergency Action Plan and where we aim to transition uh, the barra into a carbon neutral economy by supporting and uh, empowering our businesses uh, to grow while reducing their carbon footprint. This uh, roundtable uh, event is part of this um, uh, the climate action plan and uh, we as well develop a number of other initiatives. Uh, we soon uh, will have launch an, uh, um, funding some grants for businesses. Uh, we have, it's 300,000 in total fund. So businesses can apply for uh, 
grants from five to 25,000. And for it is about establishing businesses, independent uh, bar or businesses who are based in the bar to develop new products or services and systems, but uh, they have to um, show as well that they take uh, into consideration the negative impact uh, uh, to consider that the negative impact they take, uh, they, uh, their actions uh, taken with the, um, having the environment and look how to reduce this negative impact or might have positive, might bring positive impact in the environment through new services and product products they are developing, not only uh, on, through their own businesses, their actions, but uh, might support other businesses. This is one of the um, initiatives you are currently developing, and you can um, register your interest for that. I will post the link, uh, the email address, which is business at kingston.gov.uk. So you can send an email to us to register your interest in that initiative. At the same time, we're developing another initiative, which is about uh, environmental audits. Uh, we're looking, we like to um, work with con uh, experts uh, that uh, can perform some environmental audits. Oh, this, is, this would be a pilot initiative, a small project and a small number of businesses. Again, we'll uh, launch it and uh, we we'll invite businesses to apply who would like to uh, participate on that. We'll be, the audits will be free of charge. And uh, so we look to identify what kind of actions they can businesses can take. Zero cost actions, first of all, and lo or low this hanging fruit that uh, um, Stephanie sent or low cost actions and might be able to support you for some of the low cost actions, which will have an impact again and um, in the, will reduce the negative impact that your businesses have in the environment. So yes, and uh, please uh, keep in touch with us and uh, check our emails because uh, we're looking to develop other initiatives. We're looking to develop, to work with uh, Forbes and, and uh, develop more um, events. And please, I, please co share your views with us through the Let's Talk and uh, suggest topics for uh, future events, suggest topics for initiatives. We might not have as a council funding and uh, uh, big sources of funding, but if we have the ideas, we might be able, together with you in collaboration with other partners and our businesses might be able to access funding. So we, are, we have our ears and eyes open in uh, COP26 and uh, looking uh, what the um, from number 11 is going to announce, what announcements we'll have or funding streams. So we try uh, to do the best and uh, this um, we cannot address uh, this challenge, climate change, just working um, uh, as individuals only, but we need to work or as businesses on their own. They have to work in collaboration, to, have collab to collaborate at every level, at business level with uh, uh, local authorities, with all the partners in local authorities, regional and uh, central government. So thank you very much for participating today. And as I said, uh, send us um, your views through the Let's Talk. Thank you very, very much, Joanna. Um, we've kind of gone over the hour a wee bit, but I think you'll, f I hope you really felt a little bit of ins inspiration from what our guests have said today. Um, we've tried to make this in a very practical manner um, to allow you to take these steps forward. Uh, as Joanna said, it, it is just the very start of the conversations. Um, so we will be trying to produce more of these um, Think Greens for you in the, in the new year. But first of all, finally, I'd like to say thank you to Adam. Thank you to Stephanie, to Neil, to Paul, Joanna, and all of you, and for your terrific contributions in the chat. Um, it, it's, it's wonderful to see such engagement and helping each other because as Adam said at the beginning, trying to get clarity on a lot of this is not that straightforward. So um, keep sharing, keep um, your ears and eyes open, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you so much.